Despite concerns from investors that a sluggish economy would lead to a decrease in energy demand and subsequently reduced profits for oil companies, that's not what's happening. ExxonMobil and Chevron both demonstrating resilience in the first quarter by posting healthy profits uh, despite the drop in gas prices. Wells Fargo analyst Roger Reed is showing us now to discuss um, both of them um, seeing um, some interesting production trends, particularly what we're hearing from Exxon. Exxon also has a lot of cash on hand. Roger, first of all, just sort of give us your big picture takeaways from these two, and if there's something, a sort of theme that you're reading as we're starting to get big oil. Yeah, thanks, Julie, for having me on here. Um, yeah, I think if you look at the quarterly results, I mean, what you see is uh, these companies have reduced their costs a tremendous amount. And so, yes, prices are good, but business has actually been improved, right, from how they capture at the wellhead, the costs they've taken out of the business, and as Exxon, of course, mentioned today, you know, at a, at a larger scale, what they're trying to do on the trading side, trading throughout uh, the business along the value chains and across their value chains. Uh, Roger Ness here. And ExxonMobil, a lot has been talked about the cash that ExxonMobil is sitting on and whether or not it would acquire uh, Pioneer. There's been a report, a recent report about eyeing an acquisition. Do you see something like that happening? And if not Pioneer, which? <laughs> Always a tough question to answer for, for the company or for <laughs> us. Um, so I think, you know, if you look at what's typically made uh, M&A work in this space, it's, it's more often occurred during a time of stress, meaning low commodity prices or some other, you know, exogenous event that, uh, that creates reasons for, for mergers. Doesn't mean it can't happen, just we would be saying watch for those moments as opposed to just waking up one day and seeing something. The other thing to watch, though, of course, is the quality of the asset that is being considered, right? So no question the, the companies that have been mentioned out there for consolidation have those quality assets. But uh, I don't want to go too far down that rabbit hole because, you know, it's all conjecture at this point. But if so, if they were to be looking for an acquisition without going too much into the rabbit hole, would they be looking for future drilling sites or would you think of um, more of an acquisition to uh, sort of increase their profile when it comes to decarbonization, let's say? I think it would all go hand in hand. And if you look, the, the Permian Basin is actually a fairly uh, competitive area in terms of carbon intensity. And the other big thing that's obviously gone on in uh, the Permian Basin and everywhere else, you know, getting rid of flaring, getting rid of fugitive emissions and, and so forth. So I think any transaction done would have that in mind. But broadly speaking, the Permian fits within those uh, or within that framework. So I, I'd be comfortable on that. I think the main reason you would see uh, any kind of transactions, though, is to do a couple of things. One, obviously, create value, right? It's got to be an accretive deal or what's the point? I think the second part of it would be, you know, the Permian Basin recovery rates out of shale wells only runs about 10 percent these days. If you look at more conventional fields, the recovery rates range from sort of 30 to a little over 50 percent. So part of buying this acreage would be thinking about it from a multi-decade standpoint, right? How do you get, I mean, double 10 to 20. It doesn't have to go to the 30 or 50, but you would get yourself to a level where there's tremendously more resource in place than what we're just looking at today, thinking how many shale wells can I put in at a 10 percent recovery factor? I mean, at the same time, um, Roger, they're getting a lot out of what they do own, and they're getting a lot out of their existing businesses, right, as evidenced by this quarter. Um, I'm curious, with oil prices where they are today, um, do you forecast any expansion there? Because you would think, I mean, if we're looking at this record first quarter, if oil prices trend higher from here, that would be gravy for these guys, right? <laughs> Yeah, and I think that's more or less how they look at it. I mean, it's fair to say in a couple of places, right, taxes have gone up. And as these companies get further removed from the COVID era, you know, the, the terrible oil prices in 2020, you're starting to see, you know, cash tax rates go up. 
So it's not all, you know, straight to the bottom line. But I think, again, you know, I mentioned at the beginning, they, they have really reduced the costs in these businesses across the corporation. So you're seeing a, a pretty big drop down for, you know, relatively modest increases in oil prices would have a pretty big impact at the, uh, the cash flow and profitability lines. Um, and when you look at Exxon uh, versus Chevron, I know you, you've got an overweight um, on Exxon. Do you think both of them are a good buy right now? Is there one you prefer over the other? So we have overweight ratings on Chevron and Exxon in terms of, you know, preference. I think it's about equal to our price target. So there's not one that's just dramatically standing out from the other. But if you look at the way these companies are operating and, and their cash returns to shareholders, so take the dividend plus the, the share repurchases, I mean, both of them are considerably more compelling than just say the S&P 500 as, as a whole. And we think that's really what you'd want to pay attention to is, you know, you obviously want to have a, a view on oil prices and expectations there. But if you have a reasonably positive outlook for the economy, a reasonably positive or, or stable outlook for the commodity prices, what both of these companies are doing is, uh, you know, like I said, definitely outperforming, you know, the broader market. And we talked about oil prices and where they're at and if they continue this way. But what if we hit a hard landing and a recession and oil prices go down uh, significantly? What if diesel and gasoline consumption uh, goes down? Uh, what happens then? Yeah, I mean, I think it's fair to say we've never seen the energy space ignore a recession, right? We've had periods where it was considerably more impacted and periods where it was less, right? So you could go back to the early 90s, uh, and even though oil prices were quite volatile in 08, you know, we really saw energy come through the global financial crisis with, you know, relative unscathing. So I would say is, you know, having seen the severity of what happened in 2020, the impact on spare capacity, the impact on reinvestment trends and so forth. Our view is energy is relatively better positioned for any kind of uh, you know recession, be it mild or something more severe. Now, that said, Wells Fargo's economics department has an outlook for a recession. We factored that into our forecast. Uh, we expect oil to go under $70 around year in meaning the, the Brent oil price. So, you know, if you look at our numbers, you look at our expectations for these stocks, we've we've got a mild recession factored in, and yet they still look pretty compelling. XOM is up 8% year to date. Chevron down 7% year to date. Today, Chevron is flat right now. Thanks so much, Roger Reed, Wells Fargo analyst.